morning, Sugar Grove. So today is a pretty special day for both Kathy and I and the whole congregation because we're not only celebrating the new lives into our church, but we're also going to get to celebrate the graduating seniors from high school. So it's some good stuff. So since those are kind of, I guess, the bookends of our uh, childhood, so to speak, uh, me and Kathy are going to be talking about the faith milestones that a child and a teenager should experience if they grow up in the church. Before I start, for those of you who don't know, this is Kathy Cameron. She's our children's minister here at Sugar Grove. Uh, And she's actually been a member at Sugar Grove for a little over 20 years now. She is married to Jeff Cameron, who is one of the children's ministry deacons. And he's also on the board for the Sugar Grove Christian School over here. So it's pretty exciting stuff that he does for them. Uh, And they have four kids, all between the ages of 20 and 26. And one of their sons, Ryan, and myself were in club together at ACU. So we have a lot of good memories together. And in case you're visiting and you don't know Jason, let me introduce to you Jason Toy. Jason is the Youth and Family Minister at Sugar Grove. He's been on staff here for two years. He's a graduate of Abilene Christian University with a degree in Youth and Family Ministry. And he's married to sweet little Casey down there. And um, we didn't didn't practice this part, but I just want to take this opportunity to say, I office next to Jason. I love him. He is the best youth minister. And if you're a parent right here with a teen in our youth program, you should breathe a sigh of relief because he, your, your kids are in good hands with Jason. We love Jason. Thanks. Well, before we kind of get into the faith mile markers, we're actually going to talk, touch on some of our, the other markers that we experience throughout childhood. And some of the main ones we kind of hear about or talk about a lot is the developmental markers, our educational markers, and our social markers. So I'm going to let Kathy kind of lead us into that. So if you, if you have a new baby... If you think back to when you had a baby or you know a baby, every parent knows about the developmental milestones, the developmental markers, when your child should roll over, you know when they should start crawling, and you know when they should start walking, and then as they grow older. The main developmental markers for our teens are you know, discovering their own, ide- their own identity and even playing an organized sport, so typically two of the big developmental factors. And driving. Don't forget driving. Yeah, I guess driving. Could That's be a big one, one. Then there are educational milestones. You send your kid off to school, and they learn how to um, do numbers and do the ABCs, and eventually they learn to read, and they have educational milestones. And the big ones for teens are obviously when you start adding with letters. That's a big one. And then <laughs> some people get the joy or agony of reading all sorts of Shakespearean literature. So those are two of the big educational markers, so to speak, in teenage years. Then there are social milestones. Think about your child in the social realm. Um, When they very first start playing as babies, they play side by side. They don't really play together. And then at some point, they turn and face each other, and they begin to play together. They play in groups. And the social markers for teens are probably parents' most favorite, which is when their child starts becoming interested in the opposite sex. Uh, and then also, you know, hanging out with their friends with a little less parent supervision. Those are typically the two main social markers for teenage years. So I think as we raise children, we're really aware of all of those milestones. The question today is, what about faith milestone markers? What are the things in our child's faith journey? Because children don't just all of a sudden wake up and be people of faith. That's just not the way it works. They, it's a journey. It's your journey, and it's their journey. And so what are the markers that we look for in our children's faith journey? Well, one marker, if we could advance the slide, is today. Um, The first time you bring your child to church and Mark says, oh, hey, so-and-so's here at church today, show off your baby, and they hold the baby up, Michael Harvey called that his baby's Lion King moment. You can see from from the slide, that's the scene from the Lion King where the baboon holds the baby up and all the animals are like, ooh, and that's what we do at church. It's a Lion King moment. There's actually a biblical basis for this, bringing your child, you know, and presenting him to God. Mary and Joseph did that with Jesus. After the days of confinement were done, they came to the temple and presented Jesus to to God. So that's what we're doing here today with Celebration of New Life. We're celebrating our new families. The church will make promises to the families. The families will make promises to the church, all in relation to the faith development of that child. So that's one mile marker that we wanted to talk about today, and we'll talk more about that a little bit later. The second one is the first time your child comes home and tells you a Bible story, recounts the Bible story that they learned at church. Now, for me, this was when Adam was three, and he came home and he told me the story that he'd learned in Miss Pinky's class about Samuel and Eli. It was when Samuel was living with Eli, and God called Samuel in the middle of the night, and Samuel thought it was Eli, and so he got up, and this is how Adam said it. He got up, 
And he went to EY, and he said, EY, did you call me? And he said that about five or six times, which is several times more than it really happened in the Bible. But he was so enamored with the fact that God had called Samuel. And so, even at three, I was able to have a conversation with him about listening to God. And what is God saying to us? And what is God calling us to do and be? And it was an opportunity to have a discussion with him. Well, he had that opportunity because he heard that Bible story. And that makes me think of Miss Pinky who I'm going to embarrass for just a moment. Miss Pinky, would you stand up, please? I want to do a little tiny experiment. Miss Pinky's been our three-year-old teacher for a really long, a super long time. I want anybody in this room who has had a child in Miss Pinky's class, who has been in Miss Pinky's class, or has helped Miss Pinky teach her class to please stand up. Nice. Okay, that's a pretty big ripple in our pond, y'all. That's a big ripple. Thank you. Can we please give Miss Pinky some appreciation? So your children aren't going to all of a sudden open their mouth one day and tell you a Bible story out of the clear blue. They're going to do that because you've taken them to church and you've told them Bible stories yourself. You've talked about it and you've modeled that kind of um, behavior and those kinds of activities. So we're thankful for people like, like Miss Pinky who provide that here. We want to encourage parents to do that at home as well. The third mile marker that I'm going to talk about is the first time your child recites a scripture. Now, this is a cool moment, and I have received lots of videos from people doing this. I picked this one because I could understand this child, and Van could edit it a little bit for me. So, Van, y'all, this is Layla Albright, and I think she's four, just barely. Jesus and blessed the Lord when I show my Actually, I think she's three. So let's play it. Now that you know what she's saying, play it one more time. It's really short, and it's so cute. Jesus, bless the Lord when I show my happy neighbor as he so Matthew 22. So once again, <laughs> once again, your children are not going to rise up out of their bed one morning and quote scripture at you out of the clear blue sky. That's just not the way it happens. It happens because someone sits at home with them and works with them and talks to them about the scripture. Their children see that the scripture is important to their parents. The Bible is read at home. The Bible is read to their children. That's how these things happen. Do you think at some point when Layla's a teenager and she's feeling particularly unloved, this scripture can come back to her and comfort her and help her? Um, these are important things to lay upon our children's hearts, but it doesn't happen by accident and it doesn't happen with no effort on our part. But that is the third mile marker. And so now the three, I guess, major mile markers I'm going to be talking about for your teenage years. Obviously, these aren't all of them that happen, but these are the three that I kind of chose that are significant in our faith development. The first one is committing your life to Christ. That's generally a pretty huge one for anybody that, you know, becomes a part of this Christian family. And it doesn't always happen in the teen years, nor does it have to happen in the teen years. But if a child grows up in the church, it probably will happen in these years. Uh, commitment can mean a lot of different things, and most regularly, the major milestone for that is baptism and uh, your response to that, which, as most of you know, that signifies the outward expression of your inward decision of committing your life to Christ. And it's also a way of saying to the congregation, I'm joining this Christian family with you. I want to be a part of this. I want to be a part of this faith. And this is something that the family, I, in my personal opinion, I think should have the most impact on your, your teen's faith development. They should be the ones kind of instigating this charge for baptism, or at least talking about it, having that discussion. Obviously, they'll be talking about it with their ministers and all that stuff, but I think it's really important for in the household, that's where that discussion kind of takes place. And for parents out there that are maybe like, ooh, I don't know if I can handle that. That's a lot of, that's a lot of pressure, a lot of responsibility. Kathy and I both have materials and topics and all sorts of stuff that can kind of help you launch into that, because I do think it's really important for you as the parents of your children to like, take that first step into their new journey of faith. And uh, I have a picture up here. It's actually, it happened last summer, and it's one of our own, Josh Britt. Uh, last summer when we were in Lubbock on our mission trip, I, he asked me if I would you know, do the honor of baptizing him. You know, I called Robert and said, hey, is it okay if he happens here? We can wait till he gets home. And Robert graciously said, no, he wants to do it. Let's just go for it. And so it's really cool because uh, what happened is, you know, baptizing him was my first baptism to ever get to do. So I was super excited. He was really excited. <laughs> And the coolest part of it was afterwards, after I dunked him and pulled him back up, 
everybody just cheered and jumped in the water. It was like a big pool party. Everybody else dunked him just to make sure he got completely baptized, you know. <laughs> Didn't want to miss the spot. Uh, and so it was, just, it was just really cool because, you know, this, it's a big decision. That's a cool thing for when our teens finally get to that moment, or even our children, when they finally say, hey, I'm ready to commit. That should be a celebration because they're a new part of our family. You know, it's a new step in their journey. It's not the end, but it's the beginning of their Christian walk. And so it was just really cool. The second mile marker, well, actually, these next two that I'm going to say usually happen because of that first one. They don't always happen that way, but usually the next two will follow suit with this one. So the second one is sharing your faith with a non-believer. Now, this one, studies typically say that around age 14 is when a teen or a child, however you want to say it, will typically share their faith with someone. Because that's kind of when they get to a point where they feel comfortable talking to someone about something like that. Uh, sharing your f- faith means, can mean a lot of things. It can mean that you're just really excited about your own faith and so you just can't help but talk to other people about it. It could mean that you just really care for your friends or those around you, their souls, because you're like, I really want them to know the good news so they can join me. Or it could just mean that, you know, you're a zealous faith seeker that you're like, I want to make sure everybody knows about this, you know, because that is one of our callings is to share the gospel and spread it among all the nations. And this is something that I think we far too often just hope that our teens will do. You know, and I think we just assume once you get, once you get baptized, once you kind of start your journey, you'll just share your faith. That's just a part of it, right? But that's a scary thing. I'm sure most of us in here are like, I'm not even good at it, and I'm, I'm 24, and I'm not good at just walking with someone and being like, hey, so let me tell you about Christ, which I don't know if that's always the appropriate way to do it. But the most important thing, I think, for us as a church family is to go up to our teens and ask them, hey, tell me about your faith. Tell me about your relationship with God. If we start doing an active role in that, they'll be able to get comfortable with that language of explaining to you, well, this is how my faith works. This is how, this is how I believe God is. They can get that practice in these walls where it's a safe place, where if they do stumble over their words or mess up, so to speak, there's no pressure because you're going to love them regardless. So I think it's really important for us to let them have that practice, to have that opportunity to kind of talk it out, so to speak. That way, whenever they do have an opportunity to share it with someone, they're going to be ready because they've already done it 10, 15 times with people in this room. So I think that's something that's really important for all of us to remember is don't be afraid to go up to a teen and just ask them, how's your faith? Tell me about your faith. What does God mean to you? I just think that'll be really cool because that way they get that practice of telling their unique story in the grand story of of God. So the third mile marker I'm going to touch on is uh, taking a stand for your faith. Now this is one that I think happens at all ages of life and it constantly happens. It's not a one-time thing and then you're done with it. You don't take a stand anymore. (laughs) Uh, But in the teen years, I really think it makes the biggest impact on on their faith and makes the biggest impact on people around them. Because when you're willing to say, no, I, I'm, I can't do that. I don't, I don't really believe in that, or I, I don't think that's right. That speaks a lot to people who maybe have never heard the word, or maybe people who have heard the word and only seen Christians who do the same thing everyone else is doing. Taking a stand can be a huge thing. And one of our uh, seniors actually shared with me, I asked some of the seniors to send me some stories and whatnot about this, and one of them actually said that he feels like every single day he gets pressure from his peers to kind of just give up on the faith thing. He says, but he knows that God has his back and that God will be there for him and is faithful to him. And that's what helps him get through. And so every single day for him is taking a stand for his faith, saying, I choose to believe. And that's huge. That's awesome, too, that he's, he's willing to do that. And he's comfortable enough with his faith to know that my God's big enough to take care of me, even if the rest of you don't think he can. So that's just really cool. And the, the biggest thing with all these, all the three that Kathy spoke about, the three that I'm talking about, it's about us, the church family, your home family, if we're not acting out these things, if we're not encouraging our children and our teens to do these things, like Kathy said, they're not just going to come out and do them. You know, some of them may, it happens every once in a while where someone just kind of comes into it, but if they don't see the value from their parents that this is an important thing, this is something worth living for, it's worth something taking a stand for, then it's going to be really hard for them to want to do it. Because especially as children, and even in teens, you do what you see. And if they see you out there serving, out there living missionally, out there trying to, you know, share with others, take a stand when people are down, like bashing your God. If they see you doing those things, they're going to respond. It may not be right away, but they'll, they'll remember it. They'll take it to heart. So that's, the, I guess, the encouragement and challenge is we have some responsibility in raising these kids. And we have some responsibility in raising these teens to be people of faith. But we have to act it too, because they won't just do it if we tell them. We have to show them. It's a generation of very much show me, show me, show me. That's what we have to do.